Good morning. Thank you, Carlina. I hesitate to get in the way of fellowship, but uh, you know, why don't we just have church? Good morning to another beautiful day in Northeast Ohio. And uh, we can thank the author of that. He provided such a beautiful day outside and he's gonna provide a great day inside. One of, uh, as you walked in today, you should have received one of these, our, our worship folders. I hope you read through that. I'm gonna hit on a few announcements. Uh, first of all, if you brought your tithes and offerings today, um, the ushers will collect them at the end of the service. And um, by the way, that's online, uh, giving online. <clears throat> and then if you're a guest with us, um, right in front of you should be a little uh, card, a welcome card. I hope you uh, fill that out and let us know how we can reach out to you during this week and, and welcome you to the, to the church and also tell you what's going on here at East Canton Church of God. And that is also, uh, those welcome cards are also online. Uh, so today, uh, downstairs... Uh, we have more opportunities to sponsor families in our community. And a lot of families have gone through some difficult times, and we who have uh, the ability to help, we can. And so uh, there's a little tree downstairs, can't miss it. Grab one of those uh, cards, and it'll give you all the information you need to, uh, to support them. Also, our uh, annual post office starts today. If you have Christmas cards for those within the, in, in our congregation, you can drop those off. Uh, also, just a little donation. Anything that we collect here, uh, we're going to bless our, our Alcoholics Anonymous group, AA group, that meets here on Monday nights to a dinner. And uh, so I appreciate your support, not, your support, not only the post office, but also of that important ministry that we have here at the church. Uh, Moms group, uh, we, you continue tomorrow at 930. I hope you uh, young moms will, will take advantage of that. Uh, and the youth uh, Uganda team applications for 2025 is today, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. You got it, right, right there. It's going to be an awesome trip. And then uh, young adults, uh, please uh, reflect or uh, remember that uh, the Hunter's House is open today uh, for their annual turkey tribute. That's right after church today. This is truly the day that the, the Lord has made, and we get to rejoice and be glad in it. I was uh, reminded today as I, as I was uh, looking over our, our plan in, uh, in John 16, uh, Jesus' uh, promise that the Holy Spirit would come. I am thankful that the Holy Spirit brings himself into our presence today and allows us to be the worshipers who worship it both in truth, that's by his word, but also by his, his spirit. So as we, as we bow our heads and open up our hearts, let's invite him in if we could. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, for this day. We thank you for the privilege you give us to be the worshipers you've called us to be, worshiping in spirit and in truth. Holy Spirit, we can't do that without you. And I know you indwell within every believer, but as we gather to, together today, we're going to focus on, your, on the Son of God, but we can only do so through, for the, for, through you, our Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, enter into this place, enter into our hearts, and transform us. We ask all this in the name of Jesus and all his people said, amen. amen. Please stand, find someone close to you and greet them. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to gather with you this morning. Um, if you can't see me, I'm at the piano. So <laughs> let's worship together and lift his praises high together this morning.
everyone. It's a privilege to be with you this morning. As we go into our next song today, um, I just want to read the words of the verse that we're going to start with. It says, how firm a foundation you saints of the Lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. If he is your firm foundation this morning, will you give him a shout of praise today? Amen. Let's continue singing together as we glorify the name of Jesus.
would you please bow your heads with me this morning? Dear Lord, we thank you for how good you are. Lord, we thank you that you are the same God who was with Daniel through the lion's den, the same God that was speaking to Moses, the same God in the burning bush, the same God who has performed so many miracles that we read throughout the Bible, throughout our time in the word. Yet, Lord, you are the same God then and you are the same God now and you forever will be the same God. Mm -hmm. Lord, we call upon you because we know that without you, we do not have hope. We know that we call upon you because you are hope. We call upon you because you created us in your image. And when we fall short, we knew, you knew that we couldn't do it without you. So you sent your son, you humbled yourself to this earth. You walked among us, you carried the cross, and you suffered the most unimaginable death that we could imagine. But death could not hold you. You defeated death, and on the third day you rose, and now you are at the right hand of the Father. So Lord, we thank you that you are the same God who has done all of these wonderful things, and we are so grateful that we could build our lives upon your firm foundation. Lord, the song that we're going to sing to you says, I'm calling on the God of Jacob whose love endures through generations, I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same thing for me. Oh God, my God, I need you now. Oh rock of ages, I am standing on your faithfulness. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And in this time, if there's anyone who does not know what it means to have their life changed through a relationship with you, Lord, we pray that today would be the day that that changes, that they would hear and feel your spirit moving in this place in such a powerful way that they cannot deny it. And Lord, anyone who has fear of taking that first step and coming forward and saying, yes, I want you, and Lord, I need you, please enter into my heart and into every aspect of my life. Lord, we pray that today that would happen. And as we continue to lift these songs to you and this time to you, and we hear the word that you are going to speak through Pastor Greg today, Lord, we pray that all of that would be for your glory. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we praise you and we're so excited to continue to see, hear, and feel how your spirit is moving in our time together. It's in your name we pray.
I was listening to you sing. You did a good job. What a great reminder that um, the God who fed the thousands brought manna from heaven, who healed the sick, bound the wounded, gave sight to the blind, loosened the tongues of the, the dumb, and the ears of the deaf is the same God that we were celebrating 
and we are celebrating right now. So please bow your heads with me. And before we pray, I, I just ask in the quiet of that moment that you're there seated, even online, wherever you may be. Spend a moment and, and give thanks. Father, we, we do give thanks today. Give thanks for a baby's cry. We give thanks for moms and dads and grandma and grandpas and all the family you give us. Thank you. We thank you uh, for your son, Jesus, and your Holy Spirit. For you. And Lord, we confess that um, we don't give thanks enough. Here as we approach a national holiday of Thanksgiving, we pray that we truly would be the nation that gives thanks rather than just takes a day off. Giving thanks for food, for drink, for sustenance, your provision, for the ability to, to get around and to serve others, to work, to learn, to grow, even to get around for transportation to get us here. And I thank you for your church as you've brought us together by your will. It is not a coincidence that we're here. And I thank you for every soul here in this room online for gathering us together in the name of your son, Jesus, whose name means salvation, saved from sin. If there's anyone here who hasn't given their lives to you, I pray they would today, this day the day of salvation. Lord, there are those here who need healing for their finances to somehow connect, for relationships to be restored, and so I pray for them. And there are those who have asked us to mention their names specifically, and so we do. We, we ask for your touch and presence in the lives of Jennifer Walker and Callum Shook Cheryl Bradley, Linda Barnes, and Barb Middow. For Charlie and Marie Markowski, Carter Reidenbach, Adriana Stewart, and Sharon Madison. For Lee Fuller, Eric Thurman, and Irene Gully. Donna Oberly, Debbie Brooks, Brett Steimer, and Steve Hill. Henry Hilger, Darlene Houston, David Spear, and Debbie Eiler. For Sharon Feldner, Brad Miller, and Bill Weichel. We also ask for your touch and presence to be on Glenn Ellington and that family as well. Today, we're, we're remembering those that uh, were tragically taken from us this past week, week and a half throwing a community in such heartache. And so we pray for the families of Aidan McNutt, Shannon Wigfield, Caitlin Owens, for John Mosley, families of Christy Gaynor and David Kernett, Kennett, and Jeffrey 
world. We also think of the families of those who were lost on October 7th in the brutal, brutal, I don't even know what to call it, Lord. It's not a, just a tragedy, it's a, it's a mark against your people. In Israel, f- over 1,400 people have died. Over 200 still kept in bondage and the thousands that died after. Lord, we pray for peace. Peace peace in your land. And we pray for peace in our land. There's so much turmoil, so much conflict. Watch over those who serve in your name, whether here in the community, whether our missionaries on the ground far away, presidents and legislators and judges. May there be peace. May we each bow our knees to you and recognize that we cannot do this without you. Bring us to a unity that's only found through your son, Jesus. Today, we open up your scriptures and think about a little town and, or a little church in a bigger town in Philadelphia. And so we ask that as we look at the story and listen to the words of your son, that the words of a mere man would fall to the floor, but that which is from you would change us. Lord, we seek transformation. We seek to be those who conquer this life and overcome and all by holding fast to you. We ask this in the name of Jesus and all his people said, amen. A few uh, months ago now, I guess, um, we had a young man here who was heading off to basic training in the U.S. Army. Has anyone been to basic training? Raise your hands. Both of us, okay. Some of us, there's some more. It's pretty scary walking into that. You just don't know what you're going to get. Remember our son when he went, I may have told a few of you this, he, he got some advice from his great uncle. He says, just get to the next day, Lewis. That's all you got to do, right? Get to the next day. And when he went, he was just getting to lunch, just to dinner. For God's sake, get me to breakfast. And so I, uh, I was uh, talking to this young man, and uh, he's almost done uh, with his basic training. He's doing well. But uh, my only advice I gave him is the advice I wish I would have received before I went in. And that is to stay away from those who just want to get by. Stay away from those who major in mediocrity and find yourself among those who focus on finishing well. You know, and I think that advice is not just for basic training that some of us will never go to and some of us would never want to go back to. But I think it's for life, right? To focus on finishing well, not just, not just uh, in, in school or in work or um, retirement, but in our faith. And, and today, you know, I was reminded of that as we, as we open up, and please get your Bibles out and go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Um, uh, that's... We're going actually to verse 7 of 3 to 13, and we're going to study this this church in the city of Philadelphia. And and in that, I'm reminded that in order to finish well, there's some things we need to do. In order to finish well, we can't do it on our own. We can't just kind of stumble into it. It's something that takes effort. It's something that takes intentionality. And I think we're going to find it in this scripture. So please stand. And again, I'm reading from chapter 3, beginning in verse 7, and we'll go to 13. 
And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write the words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. May God bless us as we study his word. Please be seated. So what do we need to focus on to finish, to finish well? Okay, let's, let's talk about Philadelphia. It's not in Pennsylvania, okay, the one we're talking about here. It's in western, uh, modern-day Turkey, just like those other cities we have been studying. This is the sixth city out of seven that we'll be in. Uh, so next week, we'll wrap up this, this series, and uh, as we prepare for Christmas, believe it or not, Christmas is just around the corner. Um, Philadelphia, again, not in Pennsylvania, and is the site, like many other cities of that time frame, of many idols. Uh, they have idols to so-called gods, including the Emperor Augustus. But the bigger issue that they're struggling with is there a sin there's a synagogue there uh, that Jesus describes as the synagogue of Satan. Now, I want to just pause briefly here because sometimes, oh, sometimes, over the centuries, Christians have used passages like this to justify the persecution of Jews. That's called something like anti-Semitism. It is persecution of the Jewish people. And there is no room for anti-Semitism in God's church. I'll say that again, no room for it in God's church. Anti-Semitism in the church is Christian spit in the face of Jesus Christ. That's what we're talking about here. And I hope none of us would ever go that direction. On October 7th, Israel experienced what, in all, for all intents and purposes, we would call their 9-11. The rape, the beheading, the burnings of people alive are too atrocious even to describe in detail. But that anti-Semitism there has unleashed anti-Semitism here. In schools, in cities across the country, they are celebrating what happened there. And again, there is no place for that in the church. Do we have an understanding? Amen. 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 So they, that particular church, as Jesus describes, weren't even Jews themselves. They had disqualified themselves even from their own heritage because of what they did. They were, uh, the, the synagogue of Satan refers to someone or to a, to a group of people who, like the Pharisees, Jesus called their father, the father of lies. So it was a different place. The church itself was a small church described as one of little power, little power socially, financially, spiritually. Last week, I told you of a little church that, G that Jesus brought uh, Sherry and, and our family to, uh, to, to serve there in Greeley, Colorado, Broadview Park Church of God. When we arrived again, there was only 13 of us, and we were five of the 13. So it was a small church. But loved ones, don't let small get in your way of a perception of mightiness. Because in that, those few people were a remnant of God's people that de de depended upon God 
his son, his spirit, his word, and were willing to grow as God brought the increase. So this is the city and this is the church. So let's talk about Jesus. In every one of these um, descriptions of, of these performance evaluations we've been going through of the churches, Jesus introduces himself in a different way. Here he talks about he's the one who holds the keys. He holds the keys. He's actually quoting from Isaiah 22, 22. It says, and I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. You could picture Jesus as at the, at the doors of the kingdom of heaven, holding the keys, allowing those in whom he decides to allow in. This is referring also to the practice of the time where the synagogue or the rulers of the area would say that you are no longer in the synagogue. We, if you're in the, uh, the plan that we've been reading through John, we went to John 9 and we saw a picture of that. We saw a picture of a man who was born blind and he was given the sight from Jesus. Jesus actually created sight as only God can do. And as he created sight, <clears throat> the Pharisees at the time didn't spend so much time worried about the site that was created. What they cared about is what day it was created on. And that day, of course, was the Sabbath. And they struggled with that as they interrogated this poor man who now was able to see them when before he couldn't. They interrogate him to the point where they threw him out of the synagogue. And Jesus comes to him and welcomes him back into the kingdom. You see, this is, this is actually a doctrine of the church of God. You are in the East Canton Church of God, and we, the church of God had, had its roots in the Wesleyan Holiness Movement in the early 18, or late 1800s, and one of our key doctrines is that men and women can't decide who gets in and who isn't in. That's actually because only by God's grace and his mercy. And so when you hear me say, when we have communion, that we have open communion. And the reason we do is that we don't get to decide that. But we trust that you will have a relationship with Christ and have communion rightly. Jesus will one day be acknowledged by that synagogue. And Jesus will one day be acknowledged by everyone. In whether you agree on this side of eternity or not. Let me give you an example. In Philippians chapter 2, 9 to, to 11, therefore God has highly exalted him. Who do you think the him is? Jesus. God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and where else? And under the earth. Let's pause there for a moment. What that means, loved ones, is that everyone's going to know that Jesus is who he says he is. And all your loved ones and all those in your, in your workplace and schools and wherever you happen to meet, even if they do not know him now, they will know him one day. And they will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Does everyone want to get that? And our intent, of course, is that everyone would recognize Jesus is Lord on this side of eternity, on earth and then in heaven, as opposed to under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. See, this evaluation is different. <clears throat> this evaluation is different because normally when you have an evaluation, remember you have an evaluation that says, okay, this is what you did last year and this is the stuff that's going well and this is the stuff you gotta work on, right? There's no third category in this particular evaluation. There's only two of the seven that are like that, and Philadelphia is one of them. Philadelphia and Smyrna, they were on track. They were on point for Jesus. And so Jesus, so we're going to look at this a little differently uh, than we have in the other churches. We're going to look at what can the church in Philadelphia expect and what can they be expected to do, and then what can conquerors expect? You ready? Well, that was weak. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. So what can the church in Philadelphia expect? They can expect to be recognized for their patient endurance. How many here excel at patient endurance? I thought so. We have some work to do there, don't we? Well, they were known for it. 
And because of that, they were going to be spared from the hour of trial that's going to affect the whole earth. Now, what is this exactly? We're not sure. Because he says, I'm coming soon. So, so which, what might it be? Now, let's look at the time. So when uh, in the first century, Revelation was either written in the 60s or in the 90s. What you believe on that affect how you look at what this means. The hour of trial could have been if it was Revelation was written in the, in the 60s, just three decades after Jesus was on the cross. It could be talking about his return as the Romans came and wiped out the temple of Jerusalem. Could have been talking about that. Or if it was written in the 90s, it could be uh, talking about all the persecutions that were going to come from the top down. That is from the emperor on down to, to his people. They could have been spared those kind of things. But nonetheless, we know this, that Jesus was coming soon. Many of the previous churches have been warned, that we've already studied, that Jesus was coming soon. But this church was different. Why? Because they were eagerly looking for his return. And so Jesus was saying, not as a warning, I'm coming soon, but as a gift, as a confirmation. I'm coming, I'm coming soon. And they were eagerly awaiting for Jesus to come eagerly awaiting. We're going to talk about this later, but do you eagerly await Jesus' coming? I've discovered the older you are, the more you will nod your head that direction. Are we eagerly awaiting Jesus? But that, that was their expectations of Jesus, but he had expectations of them. They were to hold fast to what they have. Now again, holding fast is not like I hold this, this bottle of water. I mean, I'm holding it kind of easy, right? Holding fast is like being on a ship in the ocean, 50-foot swells, and there's one rope. And you are holding on for all the white-knuckle ferocity you can. That's the holding fast that we're talking about here. Never letting go. Holding fast, but holding fast to what? What did they have? First, they had Christ and his spirit. They had Christ and his spirit. They also had God's word. If you're taking notes, these are good things to write down. Christ and his spirit, his word, and each other. Christ, the spirit, his word, and each other. Even though they were little power or of little power, they had kept Christ's word and not denied his name. But Jesus warns them in a way. He says, if you don't hold fast, then someone will seize your crown. What does that mean? Remember a few weeks ago, we, we taught that crowns in, in the Revelation is not crowns of, of like royalty. They're crowns that we get when we finish the race. They're Stephanos crowns. When you run the race in, in ancient times, you got a, a wreath around your, your head designated you, designating you as one who finished the race well. And Jesus is saying, don't let anyone cut in on you because you're on the right path. The crown of a victor was destined for Philadelphia if they held fast. So those are two expectations. Uh, expectations that they had of Jesus, expectations Jesus had of them. But what about the conquerors? What could they expect? They could expect to become a pillar in the temple of God. A pillar in the temple of God. Now, what, where is this temple at? If you know your Bibles, you'll know that in chapter 21, there is no final temple. That when the new heaven and the new earth Come in the new city of Jerusalem, there's not going to be a temple. So where were we, what kind of temple were we talking about? May I, may I suggest today that maybe the temple he's talking about is the temple that's present today in you? Maybe. Let's go with that. 1 Corinthians 3.16, don't you know that you yourselves are God's moment of temple? Temple that you are God's temple. Why? Because God's spirit lives within you. We talked about this last week. You are not the church of God without the presence of God. You're, you can't be the temple in the temple of God without the spirit 
of God, the presence of God. Okay, so let's talk about this temple. What is a pillar of the temple? If we take that into a building a few years ago, well, now almost 10 years ago, Sherry and I, we bought this house that we're in right now, and there was a wall between the kitchen and the dining room. And as we were uh, looking at that, we wanted that wall half removed so it could be more open. You know what I'm, I'm talking about, that kind, of, that kind of look? Well, we first had to make sure that that wall was not a load-bearing wall. Why is that important? Because then the walls come tumbling down, right? We don't want that, do we? So we had to make sure. Well, the temple, or the, the pillars are the same thing. If you look at the ruins of, of ancient times, what is remaining? The pillars, right? So it's important. The pillars are important for a building and loved ones. The pillars are important for God's church. A few years ago, we were studying this, this uh, particular passage in one of the pillars of our church who passed away about two and a half years ago, Norm Gobley, was talking about a time where he was in the choir loft. It used to be, I think, right here. I mean, what I meant to say, it was right over here. See, it was before my time. It got, this was about 11 years ago, 12 years ago, that it was... This, this room was uh, remodeled. But it had a choir loft, right? And he was in the choir loft. He was telling the story. He was looking across the congregation. And by that time, you know, he, he was uh, getting up in his age, and he was wondering, who are the temples going to be? In that moment, he says, you know, Greg, Pastor Greg, I, I, see, the t I see the pillars in our, in our, in our church. That's good news. Yeah. He was wise, and he saw it. See, a pillar is one upon which the structure of the building rests, and a pillar of the, of the temple of God, of his church, is one who keeps Jesus' word. Okay, a pillar keeps Jesus' word. John 14, 21, we just, we just studied this a few days ago. Whoever has my commands and keeps them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest or show myself to him. A pillar in the church, if you're taking notes, keeps God's word, keeps Jesus's word. A pillar does not deny Jesus's name. Now, denial of his name is not just saying Jesus isn't who he says he is. It's saying that Jesus can't give me salvation. Because remember, Jesus' name means what? Salvation. So it does, a pillar will not deny Jesus' name, for his name means salvation. A pillar is patiently enduring. Now, remember I asked who's patiently enduring and no one raised their hands? We need to be patiently enduring. Enduring what? Trials, tribulations, temptations, failures. Can I get a witness? Disappointments, heartaches, sorrows, and everything else this world's going to throw at you. Patiently enduring pillars will endure that as well. The, the pillars never leave God's temple. Now, that seems odd, don't you think? You know, it can't be like, I, I assume that these are supporting beams. One of the beams going, you know, I'm out of here. We're not going to have that. But in a church, what we're talking about here are pillars who have been designated, who, who, have, who have shown themselves and God has established them as a, as a pillar and go someplace else for their salvation. That means that the pillar won't go somewhere else for salvation. It means that the, the pillar doesn't leave for a, from a break or for a break from the commandments of God. A pillar doesn't leave to disregard Christ for a weekend fling. A pillar doesn't leave to kick the tires on a different temple. Now, I'm not talking about different church. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying to go someplace else at a, at a different God's temple. The only way... A pillar can remain as if the pillar is ready to be installed by the living God. 
Now, this pillar also has a name of God upon him or her. That is the name of God, the name of God of Yahweh, or simply called the name. It could be, and also the name of the new Jerusalem will be on that. But something strange so that Jesus says, it'll be a, my new name will be on that person. Now, is it the name that we know, Yeshua, the, the name above every names that we've already talked about today? Maybe, maybe it's a different name that will be revealed in eternity. In Revelation 19, 12, he has a name inscribed, talking about Jesus, that no one knows but himself. Maybe it's in those things. But you know what? Maybe we're focused on the wrong thing. Maybe instead of focusing on what the name is, maybe be focused on we have the name. Maybe focus on that instead, right? That's the big deal. It's, to be, it's an honor to be marked by the name of Jesus. So what does all this imply? It implies that a pillar won't be a pillar someone else, somewhere else. It implies that a pillar won't give up or fade. Don't miss the warning in this, loved ones. You see, while no one can shut what Jesus opens, nor open what he shuts, bitterness can rob us of that privilege. I'll say it again. Bitterness can rob us of the privilege of being a pillar in God's temple. See, all through these evaluations, Jesus is warning them, remember? Hold fast, not hold delicately, hold fast. Again, like you're on that ship, and here comes another 50-foot swell. See, all through the, the, through the evaluations, Jesus is warning them to hold fast to Jesus, to hold fast to his word, to hold fast to each other. In Hebrews 3, beginning in verse 12, going on to 14, take care, brothers and sisters, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another. What does exhort mean? Does anyone, can anyone help me? Encourage. Build up. Challenge. Spur one another on. Because we know what's at stake, right? But exhort one another every day as long as it's called today. Is it today today? Okay that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And let's look at this next verse. For we, for we have come to share in Christ. That's a statement. If, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. We sang about firm foundation a few moments ago. That firm foundation we need to hold fast to, to the end. It reflects, that firm confidence reflects someone who is not only a pillar in God's temple, but willingly and eagerly desires to be a, temp, a pillar in God's temple. In your notes, hold fast to Christ, his word, and each other as pillars in his temple. Hold fast to Christ, his word, and each other as pillars in his temple. So don't answer this question, but I want you to think about it. Are you a pillar in God's temple today? Or do you want to be a pillar? See, I think if we're honest, many of us would like to be near the, temp near the pillar and let someone else do the work. Can, can I get an amen, huh? Right? But God has called you to be a pillar. You, you're like, me? Yeah, you, and you, and all y'all. Because do you want to overcome? Do you want to be the conqueror? I got great news for you. You get to be the pillar. You're going to be a pillar. What does it mean to be a pillar? It means to be established. It means to be reliable. It means consistent. It means someone who supports others. Someone who Norm Gobley looks across from the former choir loft and says, yeah, that one's a pillar. What can you do to be such a pillar? I'm going to give you four words. Trust, endure, embrace, and expect. Trust, 
endure, embrace, and expect. Okay, well, who are we trusting? We trust the gatekeeper, the one who has the keys, the one who opens and no one will shut, the one who shuts and no one will open. His name would be Jesus. Do you believe that he's that guy? Do you believe he's the son of God who came to earth, died for our sins, rose from the dead, and is offering us forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life to everyone who believes? Do you believe that today? See, your belief is measured by your trust. Your belief is measured by your trust. Let's let's look at it a different way. Do you believe that song, he's got the whole world? In his hands, come on, he's got the whole wide world. In his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole My wife's laughing at me. That's not a good sign. Does he? Okay, you, have you read the paper lately? No, you don't read the paper. Do you, have you got online lately? He's got the whole world in his hands. Do you believe that? Well, think back in the last week. When were you afraid? When were you anxious? When did you worry? Because, loved ones, there's a difference between worry, which is a low-grade fever of fear. There's a difference between worry and concern. Okay? Okay? Concern is recognizing an uncertain future outcome that could be troubling and motivates us to solve or minimize the issue, right? That's concern. Let me give you an example. You know, uh, Sherry and I, we, we get to uh, tomorrow, head out to uh, Colorado to visit our son. We'll be there just a few days and come back, trying to avoid the Thanksgiving challenges of tra- air travel. Now, I'm concerned about the trip. What do I mean? Well, let's, you know, I'm concerned about transportation. I want to make sure my car is working. Even though it's a Volvo and the word means to roll, it's always going to roll. But I want to make sure, right? And I want to make sure our flights are on time and so on. You know, and if I'm aware of recent failures in the airline, I just might change my plans. But other than that, we're good, right? Concern is healthy. Concern is natural. But worry, on the other hand, is based on assumptions for the future, driven by fear and anguish, creating further fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Let's continue the example. I am not calling the airline, checking on the credentials of the pilot, <laughs> nor, the, more importantly, the credentials of the mechanic. I'm not allowing worry to debilitate me and lock me up to the point that I can't function robbing me of an opportunity to visit our son. Are you concerned or are you worried? I got great news for you because when we trust Jesus that he really has the whole world in his hands, then we can let go of that which we cannot control. We focus on what we can do and give the rest to him, truly trusting in the weird, the words of that Silly song that means so much. Trust is also shown through obedience, especially in trials and tribulations. Loved ones, pillars of the temple trust the gatekeeper. Pillars of the temple trust the gatekeeper, Jesus himself. So we trust, then we endure. This is the part that you guys don't like. Endure patiently. You know, All through the scriptures, the Bible is very clear. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. That's actual quote, uh, uh, Lamentations 3, 24, 26. Uh, It says, the Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Again, it is good. Read this with me. You need to read it. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. See, trouble may come to the United States beyond what we've had to endure before, or maybe not. 
Trouble may come to God's church beyond what we've had to endure, or maybe not. Trial and trouble may come to you beyond what you've had to endure up until this point in your life, or maybe not. You, know, you may experience difficult test results, whether in school or from the doctor, challenges in your family, financial woes, relationships that just aren't working like you hoped it would. To endure patiently requires discernment. To discernment to know what you can control and what you cannot control. It doesn't help, loved ones, to shake our fists at God and ask him why. It does help by realizing that his presence and power is made manifest, that is, shown in our weaknesses, especially in the most difficult of circumstances. Paul was complaining about this thorn he had in his side, and this is what God said to him. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. This is, then my Paul goes on. Look at, look at this. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. How many times have you boasted about your weaknesses? I could say, I don't boast about those at all. But here he says, boast about them. Why? Why? So the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content. Okay, only say this if it's true. Are you content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities? That's a tough road to hoe, don't you think? But that's what it takes to endure patiently. For when I'm weak, what happens? Then I am strong. It is, loved ones, in the patient endurance that God's presence and his power and peace is demonstrated in your life. To endure patiently requires, of course, prayer. Do what you can and then pray for the rest. So when should I pray? Pray in the morning and the evening and everything in between. Do that. If you feel yourself beginning to worry, what should you do? Pray. If the doctor's given tough news, what should you do? If the culture seems like it's going to heck in a handbasket and tough on you, what should you do? If, and do not pray without doubt. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. But instead, pray with expectation. In Psalm 5, verse 3, O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice or my prayers for you. And what do I do? Ah! I watch. <laughs> Savion's helping me over here. That's awesome. Loved ones, pillars pray with expectation. Pillars endure patiently. But to endure patiently requires, requires us to embrace Embrace what he's given us. And I'll give you three things. He's given us so much more, but three things. One is his righteousness, his word, and his church. When you receive Christ, you become born again with his Holy Spirit. You receive and are covered by his righteousness. Now it's not your righteousness, it's his. Pillars are known for Christ's righteousness. When you receive Christ, you become born again with his Holy Spirit. You receive the Holy Spirit's insight as you listen to his word. Read it, study it, memorize it, and meditate on it. Loved ones, pillars know God's word and hold fast to it. When you receive Christ, you become born again with his Holy Spirit. You receive the Holy Spirit's belonging as you become part of his church. The pillars belong to God's church. So we, we trust the gatekeeper. We embrace his word. We endure patiently. And now we expect his return. We expect his return. See, when I hear that people are looking for his return, it's typically preceded by a dissatisfaction with the world. Greg, Pastor Greg, the world's going to heck in a handbasket. I'm waiting for Christ's return. You've said that to me. I've heard it. Right? You, know, you, just look, you just look in the news and go, oh, I can't believe. It's like an escape. And, and I can understand. Believe me, I can and feel it. But shouldn't we look for his return because we want to see him? You know, when the kids come over, I'm, I'm like looking out the window, waiting for them to come. 
Shouldn't we be like that for Christ? To be looking for his return? When Jesus returns, he's going to come with judgment of the most perfect kind. He's the only one who judges justly. He comes with the resurrection of the dead to see your loved ones again. That's a good deal, isn't it? He brings the new heaven and the new earth. And Jesus, when he returns, he also returns in little ways until then. For where two or three come together in Jesus' name, there he's with you. Aren't we to re expect the return of Jesus? And not to pull the plug, but to eagerly expect his return because we want to see him again. In your notes, hold fast to Christ, his word, and each other as pillars in his temple. Hold fast to Christ, his word, and each other as pillars in his temple. So we trust the gatekeeper. We endure patiently. We embrace what he's given us, and we expect his return. But there's one thing remaining. You know, maybe it's time for us to stop majoring in mediocrity and focus on finishing well. Maybe it's time to, to say, you know, I know it may be hard to be a, t a pillar in God's temple, but that's what he's calling me to do. That's what I'm going to do. Maybe it's time to focus in on finishing well as pillars in the temple of God. So where are you at with that? Don't answer it, but if you journal or if you write things down, maybe you should write down something to God. God, help me to become a, temp a pillar in your temple. Or maybe start even more basic. Help me to desire to be a pillar in your temple. Because the one who conquers and the one who overcomes, that's, that's what you get. Please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for this challenge. And Lord, I, I ask for your forgiveness that uh, there's times that I don't want to be a pillar of a temple. We get tired. We get uh, frustrated and disappointed. But I know that by your power and your grace and your mercy, you can not only give us that eager desire to be a pillar, but the strength and discernment and patient endurance to do just that. I pray that everyone here, even online, would seek to become a pillar in your temple, providing support, being discerning, enduring patiently, embracing what you've given us, and all on top of an increasing trust in your son Jesus and by your Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. On my left, your right is a place where you can come and pray by yourself. On my right, your left is a place where people will come and pray with you. But come, please stand.
calling on the God of Mary, whose favor rests upon the lowly. I know with you all things are possible. I'm calling on the God of shepherd boy courageous I may not face Kavai but I've got my own giants oh God my God I need you oh God my God I need you now how I need you now oh rock oh rock of ages I'm standing God a praise offering, will you? So as a buddy of mine would say, Greg, that was a big cookie. I put uh, God's word in front of you 
so that you might consider being that pillar. And I encourage each one of you to prayerfully consider that, that God has not called you to mediocrity, but it calls you, calls you to a life that finishes well. May God bless you. Go in his peace.